Welcome everyone to the Northeast Indiana Basketball Summit. I'm your host, Ben Smith, joined by my co-host, Jeff Metzger. Before introducing our guest, we want to thank Feel for the Game for providing the platform to have all these presentations live and available for replay. You can check out all the resources over at feelforthegame.com. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Scott Cooper, head coach, IU South Bend. Uh, coach Cooper uh, lived in Wooster, Ohio. He attended Allegheny College, where he was a three-year starter on the basketball team. As a freshman, they made the NCAA D3 tournament. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in mathematics and a minor in psychology. He got his master's degree in education from Alfred University. Um, he got his starting coaching at Alfred University for six seasons from 2002 to 2008 as an assistant coach. He then went back to Allegheny College for two seasons as an assistant coach. During that time, the team improved from seventh to third in the conference. He then spent one season as an assistant at Alderson Broadus College. He then moved over to Ohio Wesleyan for two seasons as an assistant, where his teams had an overall record of 43 and 14. 2013, he became the head coach at IU South Bend. This past season was his seventh, where the team went 25 and eight overall, 16 and six in conference, a 12 win improvement from the previous year, and they also won the conference tournament. They ended the season on an eight game winning streak before the national tournament was canceled. Coach, I know you and your team were excited about the opportunity to compete at nationals, but being a couple months removed, can you talk a little bit about handling the highs and lows of finally breaking through only to be ultimately denied, especially um, by something that was outside of your control. Yeah, it's one of the most bizarre things I've ever been around. Um, you know, I've been a college coach in some way, shape, or form for 18 years now, and uh, you know, you deal with a lot of different things, as I'm sure you do at every level. But uh, um, you know, when your season ends, it's usually something that's within your control. Maybe you didn't win enough, or you played a team that was better, or whatever the case happened to be. And in our case, obviously, it was something that we had absolutely no control over. So um, to sit there, you know, it's just an odd feeling of having no closure. But uh, you know, eventually you settle down and you move on to the next thing, and uh, you know, you get excited about uh, you know the next season and the recruiting class you got coming in and those sorts of things. So that's kind of how I've looked at it. I, you know, I'm sure it's not quite as simple for our seniors and those guys whose careers ended, but uh, there are far worse ways to, you know, end your season than going out in a championship game. Absolutely. My, my follow-up question was um, what, what do you see as the, the biggest difference between this past year and previous years? You know, you've been there, this is your seventh season now. And you know, this was, was it just the, the talent or you guys finally feel comfortable with, you know, the system or talk a little bit about that. Uh, a lot of it was talent. We, you know, we, my third year here, we started to really get it going. We were, uh, I think, 19 and 14 on the season, made it to our conference championship game for the first time in school history and ultimately got beat by a team that was a lot better than us. But you kind of see we were pretty young that year. We had a good, um, really good freshman class and a solid sophomore class. So you kind of see some things going the right direction. Then the next year we started out well. We started out 10 and 5 the first semester there. And, uh, you know, it looked like we were, you know, taking that next step. And then we had all kinds of injury issues. And then we had some off-court issues where we had to get rid of uh, over the next, you know, three months, we had to get rid of like three of our best players. So um, we kind of hit the reset button at that point. And, uh, you know, now we're kind of at the phase where that group we brought in as freshmen and got a lot of experience in the, uh, the next class behind them that was uh, um, sophomores this year. So our junior and uh, sophomore classes this year have been in our program now for a couple of years. And we had a really good, you know, talented senior class and, uh, you know, have three good recruiting classes in a row, you know, they, you're only as good as the players you got, and we were able to kind of build things back up again. Awesome. So your topic is going to be positionless basketball, motion offense, but Jeff, did you have any questions for Coach before we get started? I do not have any. I know I'll have a couple at the end, though. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, hopefully I'll give you something good to ask about there. So, <laughs> um, all right, now, so I can share. I'm sorry, I'm doing this in the middle of the, as you're recording. I can share my screen. Is that okay? Yeah, you should be all good. Um, let's see what we got. Okay, I'm going to try to do it now. All right, can you guys see my screen? Uh, yes, I can see it, yep. Okay. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to try to jump in between here. My, I, I put this all into Keynote. And I've got uh, some good video stuff in here, too, that we use uh, a lot of times when people ask us about what we do. Um, that said, I can't stop it in Keynote, so I'm going to jump between that and a YouTube video so that I can kind of stop and play as we go here. But, um, you know, I don't know what to call our offense. It, it's We call it a positionless motion. We get a lot of guys that we recruit, 
you know, guys will try to pigeonhole themselves into something. I'm a small forward. I'm a five man. I'm a point guard or whatever. And, and what I've found over those years is that's the stuff just doesn't really matter. And, um, you know, we, um, when guys tell me that I, I try to like, Hey, I'm not worried about what position you play. I'm worried about what you can do. And so we want to make sure that, uh, we're getting, you know, as many versatile guys as we can get. But the nice thing about this is we can plug just about anybody into it. And that's why we call it positionless. Um, what is it? it? You know, it's a Princeton offense and ball screen motion hybrid. I, I know you guys had Coach Conley on here recently, and I know they run a lot of uh, ball screen continuity over there at Manchester. Um, that can be part of this, depending on who you've got in the game and how you want to coach it up. But um, we and we used to do that actually. We had we've had some really good offensive teams here. I think in the seven years I've been here, in five of those we've been ranked in the top uh, twenty five percent of all teams in the NAI in offensive efficiency. Um, but, you know, about three or four years ago, we, we kind of got in ahead of this. And, uh, you know, people that were shooting threes all over the place and things like that, we kind of um, started out doing that a little bit before everybody did. And, and now everybody does. And uh, we were kind of looking for, well, what's the next thing? And um, the other thing that kind of happened is, you know, people started really, when, as we were running ball screen continuities, we kind of became um, predictable. And, and not that that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, you know, I always tell people, you know, Syracuse – men's basketball plays nothing but two, three zone, but you know what, they know what you're going to do and you can't show them much that they haven't seen. So there's nothing wrong with being predictable. It's just that, uh, you know, with the talent level that we had and what we were going through, it was a good time for us to make a change and see if we could take it to another level. And um, so what we were really looking for is we were looking for something where guys were interchangeable. Um, we have, basically, we only have two jobs on the court. We have guys who set ball screens and we have guys who receive ball screens. The guys who set ball screens, we call them bigs. Uh, the players who receive ball screens, we call them smalls. Um, what we're really more focused on when we go recruiting is we're looking for skill sets. Um, as we approach games, we're really looking at who's got the right matchup and who's, you know, what's the sound on the scouting report as far as, you know, who are their weaker defenders? How are they covering ball screens? How are they, you know, helping the helper? And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, but what this really is, it's a system where everybody knows their strengths, the strength of their teammates, and how best to take advantage of those strengths within a structure. And that's, that's the best I can describe it. Um, the reason we run it is you can run it without having to worry about having the right positions. You know, it, one of the things I wasn't a big fan of when we ran ball screen continuity is we had to have two post guys on the floor. We had to have two guys who could set ball screens and roll and do all that. And, you know, sometimes I didn't have to post guys. Sometimes my best players were all guards or sometimes my best players were all guys who floated out on the perimeter. And, you know, um, I wanted to have my best players in the game. And I thought this was better for us. You know, as I started to study other teams who run stuff like this, um, I really liked the flexibility of, you know, maybe we could play a bigger lineup. Maybe we could play a smaller lineup, but we didn't have to worry about who we had on the floor. Um, the next thing is it was a good way to get our best players the most opportunities while still making everyone a threat to score. You know, again, I'm talking about uh, ball screen continuity, but a lot of offenses that are – the things I don't like about them are, are your best players aren't always getting the most opportunities. Sometimes they're equal opportunity. And so, you know, with ball screen continuity, I'm going to speak to that since that's what we used to run. Um, you know, the problem was our, not all of our, you know, perimeter guys were good in a ball screen, but they'd always end up with the ball and be in those opportunities. and you know, I, I wanted to make sure it really hurt us sometimes when, you know, teams would just force it to those guys and then we'd be in trouble because those guys weren't our best playmakers off of those things. Um, with this, you know, we can kind of emphasize things getting towards our, you know, best players and the guys that are best in ball screens or the guys that are best in close-up situations or whatever it is. We can have everybody playing to their strengths, which makes everybody a threat to score. Um, the next thing I really like is the roles are really defined. You know, players don't have to know multiple positions. You don't have to guy who knows. You don't have to have a guy who knows how to play a wing and a four. You don't have to have guys who you know aren't sure what their job is when they're on the floor. Um, we really do. I think probably the best thing about this is you just tell guy. You just make sure guys understand what they're good at, what's a good shot for them, and you know that the rest kind of takes care of itself. Um, as coaches, a lot of us are control freaks, and this is a nice combination of structure while get, still giving your players freedom. I think our guys really like to play this way in large part because they get to do a lot of the decision making. Um, but that said, I can still kind of control how the movement's going to happen and you know how the whose hands the ball's going to end up in. Um, our players always know what to do in every situation, and they get better as the season goes on. This is all we do. We don't call any plays. We have, I shouldn't say that. We have one play. Um, 
but this is all we do. You know, we'll start out in a different series of our offense, you know, depending on who we're playing against and what we're trying to exploit. But our guys always know what to do. If the offense stalls out, they know how to get back into it. If, you know, the defense breaks down, they know what to do. Um, and because this is all that we do, just kind of like that talks about with Syracuse's defense, we're going to see everything that teams are going to throw at us defensively throughout the year, you know, whether it's zone, man, or otherwise, you know, different ball screen coverages, different, you know, combinations, rotations. We're going to have seen them all. As the year goes on, we get better and better in large part because we're keeping things really simple and stay, sticking to what we do. Um, and the last thing I really like is this is really easy to teach. Um, I learned a lot of this um, when I got the head coaching job down here. A buddy of mine was the head coach for the G League team for the Houston Rockets, and they were scoring 120 points a game. And, you know, this is before the Rockets really started slinging threes all over the place and playing the way they do now. And so I spent, uh, flew down there and spent a week with them and uh, really liked a lot of what I learned from there and took it back. And, um, you know, especially a lot of the ball screen concepts and things like that. And when I got back here, you know, I was like, you know, this is dead and simple. You could run this with junior high kids. You could run this, obviously, with professionals. Now, we don't have James Harden. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it hasn't been tough for us to fit in different pieces with this, you know. Um, so I'm going to fly through these next few here a little bit because I think these are a little bit more personal to us. But um, what we call offensive musts, and I'll explain what each of these are real quickly. Um, we attack together, we take great shots, we value the basketball, we execute with pace, and we make quick decisions and move the ball. And these are things that we emphasize all the time. We have a sign when you lock, walk into our locker room, it has our offensive musts and defensive musts, and they're kind of little catchphrases that we say all the time so that our guys know exactly what we mean as we do them. Um, attack together is more about how we're going to run the floor. We, we like to run. Um, you know, we have guys who are really good at running. Now, sometimes I'll control that a little bit more if we don't have a team that's good at it. But uh, you know, we're going to sprint the floor on defensive rebounds and turnovers. Um, if you can pass ahead, you do pass ahead. That's just a rule for us. And we let whoever rebounds the ball, we let them push the ball. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Every now and then I'll have a guy who's just not a good decision maker, and we won't let them push the ball. But for the most part, we let most of our guys push it off a rebound. Um, we get we want to get the ball into the paint off the dribble or pass to score and make plays for others. You know, that's ultimately what our goal is. And then every action we run is a threat to score thereafter. Um, taking great shots. This is what I think is really important. I think you have to emphasize this with each individual guy on your team. And I think, you know, we're always looking for layups, dunks, shots in the paint, and open threes in that order. Um, we don't take any mid-range shots unless it's the last five seconds of the shot clock. And what we mean by a mid-range shot is outside the paint but inside the arc. Um, those are big no-nos for us this past season. We played 33 games, and we took 17 mid-range shots this year. So I was really, really proud of that. Um, and then we have, really have to emphasize this. And this, you know, is an ongoing process, I think, through everybody's career because sometimes guys get better and worse. But our guys have to understand that what a good shot is for one player may not be a good shot for another player. And you hear us saying to them all the time, know your game. So, you know, we've got some guys – I'll use three-pointers as an example. We have some guys that are really good three-point shooters. And we'll let them shoot threes off the move. We'll let them shoot them off the dribble. We have other guys that are very average three-point shooters, and they're only allowed to shoot them if their feet are set, their toes are at the line, and there's not a defender anywhere close enough to close out to them. Um, and we have other guys that just aren't allowed to shoot threes at all unless it's, you know, the end of the shot clock or the end of the game clock. So, um, And we do that for all our shot types, and we do that for each individual guy. So every guy's got a different um, framework of what they're allowed to shoot. And I think that, for us, is a great way for us to define roles. Um, I think it's been really successful. And I think if you really look at us, you know, even in the last couple of years, not just this year, we had a really good team, but last year we were really young and I think six of our top eight in our rotation were freshmen or sophomores last year. We still led our conference in field goal percentage and three point field goal percentage. Uh, this past year, we shot out just under 50% from three and just under 40, I'm sorry, just under 50% from the field and just under 40% from three. Um, in conference play, we were just under 42% from three. And that's not because we had such a great shooting team. I think our guys just were really smart about the shots they take. Um, value of the basketball, I think, is really important. I think, obviously, we're talking about turnovers a little bit. But we want these guys to attack full speed. We want them to be aggressive, but we want them to be under control. We'll drill that a little bit so that they understand what that is for them. And, again, each individual guy that's a little bit different. Um, we try to make sure they understand that it's not their shot, it's our shot. So if they take a bad shot, it's, it hurts us. Um, and then this one is probably our, our biggest emphasis, no emotional baggage. You know, a guy gets ticked off because he's not shooting well, so he forces one up or he gets into some, you know, um, thing with another guy on the court where he feels like he's got to show him up. Those are things we're always trying to make sure we take out of it. Or a guy, the guys who are trying to prove what they can do, you know, when you tell them they're not allowed to do something. 
Um, execute with pace. This is probably the other thing we really, really emphasize. Spacing is everything with us. I, our guys will ask us, you know, questions in practice. Well, what do I do in this situation? I'd say seven times out of ten, our answer is space the floor. Um, cut at full speed and sprint the screen. I, I probably don't do as good a job of that as um, of emphasizing that as we probably should, but we say it an awful lot. Um, every cut will and screen will not get you open, but might open up a teammate. This is something that I think when they really get it, um, they get really good at it. It's something we try to track as coaches and emphasize, or we show in film that, you know, this cut opened up this, you know, teammate to, for a shot or whatever it happened to be. But we really try to find different ways to emphasize that. Um, and this is another thing we say all the time. Our offense is over once the defense breaks down. When the defense breaks down, our rule is space the floor, get the ball into the paint. It's usually off the dribble with the guys we have right now, but it might be a post move uh, with some of our guys in the past. It might be cutting, but when the defense breaks down, offense is over. We don't want to sit there and try to execute once the defense is breaking down. That's what we're going for. Um, and the defense can prepare for what you do, but not the pace at which you do it. I can't count the number of times I say that in practice when we're working on, um, you know, shell offense or anything like that. Uh, make quick decisions and move the ball. We have a one-second rule. I think I'm sure a lot of people have heard, you know, the San Antonio Spurs talk about how they have a half-second rule to make a decision. Um, for us, it's a one-second rule. I don't think we've got guys that can make decisions quite that fast, but they have to know what they're doing. So when they, ca when they catch the ball, if they don't have a shot or drive on a bad, you know, a bad closeout, they have one second to decide what they're going to look at. Now, it might take more than one second for that thing to develop, but they have one second to make a decision. And they have an awful lot of decisions they can make in every situation. Um, we'll pass up a good shot for a great shot. Again, I think, I think that goes back to shot selection and really teaching that. And then we say this all the time, too. Our goal is to get two guys on the ball and move the ball. When there's two guys on the ball, somebody's open. And we, and we say those things all the time. And, again, we try to really emphasize that when we're doing our film breakdown or in practice when we're setting up an example of what we're looking for. So our offense, we're not sitting there looking for a specific shot necessarily. We're looking to break down the defense and then attack it appropriately. Um, our motion rules. And this is where the kind of the meat and crux of it is. I'm going to talk about the X's and O's a lot, but I think sometimes this is probably more important. On a pass from a big to small on the perimeter, all right, we're, going to follow a, we're going to follow that pass with a ball screen. There's one exception to that that I'll go over towards the end, but anytime a big passes to a small on the perimeter, we are following that pass and setting a ball screen. Um, a pass from a big to big on the perimeter usually means we're getting to our next action. And we have a lot of different actions we can get into. Um, and there's a lot of different scenarios where that happens. But um, there's not really a whole lot that happens between those two. It's, it's getting to the next thing, usually when a big passes to another big. Um, a pass from a small to big on the perimeter without a ball screen equals we're getting into our jungle series. And, again, I'll talk about that uh, when we get to it. But um, that's almost always a trigger for that. And sometimes even after a ball screen, that can be a trigger for that as well. Um, a pass from a small to small on the perimeter is – yeah, with no ball screen means we're cutting to the rim and spacing away from the ball. Um, this one I think is hard for guys at first, you know, maybe that first week or two we're putting it in. Um, but once they get this, it really opens up big gaps for guys to drive into or to cut into um, whatever the situation happens to be. Um, every cut for us is an opportunity to post up. And this goes back to knowing your game. If you make a cut to the rim, we tell our guys that when you make a cut to the rim, if you are a guy who can post up your matchup, you post up. If you're not, you space the floor away. Um, but it's something we really try to emphasize. It's something that I think has been good for us this year. We don't have a great post-up team. Um, matter of fact, I think we out of 15 teams in our league, I think we were third to last in post-up points this year. Um, but, you know, we try to take advantage of that when we can. Um, and then I'm going to show a video on this because I think this is really important. I don't see this enough, uh, you know, when we go out and recruit or when we watch other teams. If your teammate gets downhill with the ball and your defender is not between you and the rim, and you can see the back of that defender's head, you cut to the rim. And that sounds like a mouthful, but it's really a simple concept that I bet we get at least six to ten points every single game just on this concept alone. And I'm going to show you some clips here. Um, hopefully this plays well. If it doesn't, I'm bring up the YouTube video. But uh, actually, I'm going to just bring up the YouTube video and come back to this. Um, all right, so we're talking about cutting during dribble penetration. I, I think this is probably – one of the best things we do in our offense. So in this position right here, our, our guy gets downhill. The defense is rotating over to help. Our guy right here in the far corner there sees the back of his man's head and sees that he can get straight to the rim. It's automatically cut. It doesn't matter who that person is. Everybody can make an open layup. And that's usually where you get a lot of layups and dunks out of this. 
you know, same thing here. This is in our conference championship game to tie the game. Our guys just play to their concepts. That isn't a play call. That's just a guy seeing his man turn, with his head turned. Um, they're not always highlight real plays like this, but, you know, same concept there. Guy helps over. So on this one, you can't see him. He's right behind number 33 there. But that, uh, our guy at the wing there, his defender's got his head turned, and he's above him. That's an automatic for us to, dry, or to cut into the rim. You can see it's not a real fast cut for him. He's not a very athletic kid, but, um, you know, that's another one. So, again, here, these guys obviously have a very stringent defense in the way they're going to play uh, baseline penetration. They rotate it over. They help off a number three there. They drop to help take away the baseline pass. Our guy sees it. He's cut right into the paint, and we're going to get a nice little easy layup. So we get those all the time, um, and that's something I think that uh, is probably one of the best things that we do if you – you know, I, I don't know if ever this is for everybody, but I think that concept is something that anybody can work into their offense. And that can happen off the cuts, too. I showed it all off the dribble penetration because for us that tends to be how it happens. Um, that's the video here. I'm just going to move to the next thing. That's the same video I just showed you. Um, our ball screen rules. All right, our bigs, anytime they set a ball screen, have the option to dive to the rim or roll, depending on what terminology you use, or they have the option to pop. Um, we probably, I don't have this in here, but we probably slip as many screens as we set. And when we slip, it's the same option. You can pop to the, you can pop out for a three or a drive, or you can dive to the rim. So um, that is for everybody. Um, every now and then I'll have a player who's just not any good on the perimeter for some reason. And we'll tell them that they have to dive to the rim on every single thing. But, um, you know, again, that comes back to role definition and knowing your game. Um, if a big pops on a ball screen, this is another thing I think is really good that we do, and does not receive the ball from the ball handler, the big sets a flare screen for the ball handler after he passes. So if you've got a small that's not very good on a ball screen but does a lot of other things well, like especially a guy who's a very good shooter, this is a great way to, for him to get shots. Um, it also sets up a lot of slips. I, you know, um, not quite as much this year because guys were a little bit more uh, aware of it. Uh, we didn't have as many shooters he had to pay attention to. But last year we had a – freshman who shot 59% from three and everybody paid every single, all kinds of attention to him. Anytime he came off the screen, it set up all kinds of flare opportunities. Um, we still probably got about one of those a game this year, but uh, again, I'm going to show you some video here just so you can kind of see what I mean. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll just show it to you right on here. So here are big sets of screen for our shooter. After uh, the shooter comes off the flare screen or comes off the ball screen and immediately receives a flare screen after the big pops. Again, same thing. Big pops, ball goes out, sets a flare screen. Um, guys who can drive can do this a little bit too. Um, 22 was more of a shooter for us this year, but he could get downhill on a bad closeout, and that was something he, you know, we need to get into his game a little bit more. Um, I mentioned, you know, we'll slip this screen a lot, so we pop. They go with the, you know, if that's really good against zones, or that's really good against um, switching defenses. I think that's something that. Uh, we get a lot against those. Um, next thing, if a big pops on a ball screen and the ball handler attacks to the outside, the next player away from the ball screen has to dive. The only exception to that is if the next player away is in the corner. If you're in the corner, you hold the corner. Um, but this happens on what we call a middle five and a bubble five. This happens all the time. Um, this is another thing I think is really good for us. I'm going to show this on the um, YouTube here again because I think this is a – Another thing that if you if you run any kind of ball screens, you should really have in your offense. Um, NBA teams, a lot of them will call this a 45 cut. Um, skip ahead here. Apologize, I probably should have done this on. All right, so I apologize. I'm skipping ahead. So there's the clip I just talked about. So the next concept is the pop dive action, like we call it. So if the big pops, the next guy away. So on this ball screen, our big is going to pop. So number two, as soon as he sees that our big is popping, and our guys will talk. Our guys will just tell them what they're doing. Yeah, they're popping. All right, number two's job, he's got he's to cut to the rim. And his job to do that, he's doing it once, so we take away any stunts, especially if that guy's a good shooter. All right, but two, we're trying to open up a gap um, and create an opportunity to drive, especially if you have a big that can drive. Like we had a very good one this year, the second team all-conference guy for us. He uh, was really good off the bounce, and he it opened up gaps like that, so it made it harder for, you know, pack line type of teams to help on him. So this against a 3-2 zone there, um, that's something that's really good against the zone. You know, here they run a little down coverage. Our guys tease it a little bit late, back cuts after the pop there. 
And again, I think that's something that's really good for us. Um, anytime the ball is passed ahead after a ball screen, the player that receives the pass should check the ball screen's action before moving on to the next action. Um, you'll see that's a little bit more, but it, I, I think if anybody runs any kind of continuity ball screen, um, this happens a lot. So the ball go to the slot, and some, maybe you have a guy posting up. Um, for us, we just demonstrated, uh, you know, the pop flare action. Um, that's all part of what we do. And so, you know, this happens a lot in different formations, but we want to give that a second to, to develop before we get on to the next thing. <clears throat> Our teaching progression, when we put this in, um, and I've got illustrations of all this here. I'm, I've got some, you know, whiteboard type illustrations here, and I've got some video that we'll show here. Um, but we start off. You know, our first two days of practice when we're teaching our offense, we start off with our ball screen spacing and our terminology. And then we also start off with ball screen continuity and what we call a two-player side and how to handle those. Um, those two things take – each of these things takes about two days to teach. Those two things are kind of go together, so we teach them together. Um, the next thing we'll teach is our slice action or, or, and our jungle series. Um, those happen a lot when you've got four smalls on the floor and one big. Um, it can happen with two bigs, and there's times even we'll play three bigs that that can happen. But it uh, happens a ton when you have uh, two or four smalls and one big on the floor. Um, our elbow series, our 21 entry, um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Again, this is like another two days. All these things take about two days to teach. Um, and then our 50 series, and or we'll use that as an entry as well. And then actions after the ball goes into the post. Uh, we've got a million of them. I, I don't know that any of them is any better than the other one, but I don't really demonstrate that there, but because I think everybody's, you know, the thing I tell you is if, if you have, if you're going to throw the ball into the post, make sure you guys know what to do after the ball goes in the post. Don't let them just stand. Um, there's a lot of, you know, if you watch Golden State Warriors, they have like 9,000 different things they do after the ball goes into the post. But um, just so long as you guys know what their options are, make sure that you do that. I, again, I'm not going to demonstrate all ours because I think that would take too much time. But if you have questions about it, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so our ball screen spacing, this is our terminology. Anything that has a five on it is five out spacing. Anything that has a four on it is four out spacing. Uh, most of what we run is five, um, is five out, but we can run a, a lot of stuff four out. Um, one of the things I like about playing positionless is, you know, if you hear four out, you immediately think, okay, you're going to put a low post guy down in the dunker spot or low post or something like that, or high post. We don't necessarily have to do that. We, we have a backup point guard, uh, if you were going to call him in a traditional sense, that um, doesn't shoot threes. I think he's taken five of them in his whole career. And if you count high school, I think he's taken seven of them. Um, but what he does a lot when he cuts to the rim is rather than space out, you know, to a corner or on the perimeter, he'll so get down in the dunker spot so that if fifth man helps, it's an easy dump off for him. Um, I think that's part of what being positionless is, is again, knowing your game. So I, I don't care if you're five foot 11 or you're six foot 11, um, you know, knowing your game and how to space the floor properly, I think are really important things. Um, the terminology we use for the other parts of our spacing are we call middle, sideline, and bubble, and logo. And I'll, I'll demonstrate those or I'll draw those up here for you on the next frame. All right, so this is what we call a middle ball screen. Um, and I'll, I've got some video here we'll show you. But middle, a middle five means we've got five out. So if you can see the top left frame there, um, we've got five out. And we're setting a middle ball screen. So in a middle five, we're going to set that screen in the slot just so we have a little bit better spacing. We've got two guys down in the corner and one guy at the uh, you know opposite wing. I don't think it matters who you've got where. Um, for us, our um, one of our bigs was one of our best shooters, so we'd start him out in the corner quite a bit. Um, it doesn't really matter where you put the guys though. Um, a middle five in the screener rolls that I've demonstrated again in that top left or in that top left frame. The guy drives uh, the point guard drives off the uh, thing there in the in the uh, demonstration. Um, the big rolls to the rim, and so the next guy away, following our ball screen rules, has to fill behind. Great way to get a shot or get the ball moving and uh, get guys in rotation. Um, the next frame over there, the top right, um, you know, I'm just drawing up how it works if the uh, big pops. So if the big pops, and again, I think we just showed you some video on that. The next man away is four in this picture. Um, he's going to dive to the rim. And again, every dive or every cut is an opportunity to post up. So that's a great way to create a high-low if you've got – Somebody you can post up, whether that's a big or small, it's a great way to get them a, a look in the paint. Um, and you saw in those clips that I, I should have stopped them there a little bit, but you saw in those clips that that cuts open a lot. Now, we get that quite a bit, to be honest with you, even against ourselves in practice. Um, our four spacing, we don't use a ton. Where we use it a lot is we use it against zones. 
So we don't really change who we are. We, we basically run the same stuff against man or zone, um, especially against like a two, three. Now we might change the angle of the screen a little bit uh, or how we get into that screen. But, um, you know, realistically, we're running the same stuff. So in a middle four, that bottom left corner, um, if the big rolls to the rim, um, and five doesn't necessarily in that, in that frame there, five doesn't necessarily have to be a big. That can be a small two. Um, but if the big rolls to the rim, the guy setting the ball screen rolls to the rim, two is the guy who's going to fill the behind because he's the next man away. Um, the bottom right one, I would say, is the one that happens more often when you run fours. And that is just that the big's going to pop. If the big pops, again, this is another opportunity. If you've got a guy who can post up uh, five in the frame there that's in the dunker spot, if he can post it up, that's a good way to create a high-low for him. Uh, you go pick and pop, and then you throw back to the uh, big, and he looks high-low. And, again, that doesn't have to be number five, uh, number five in that frame. doesn't have to be a big. That can be a uh, small. So um, let me show you some um, examples of middle ball screen here. Um, we run this a ton. I'd say of all our ball screens, when we start our offense in ball screen, this is typically how we'll start it. Um, we probably get to the rim. Our ball handler probably gets to the rim one out of every three times on this. So, again, in these first few clips, we're rolling to the rim. So, again, we roll. And this time, in this frame, 23 is going to tag the roll. So that opens up, too. And we talked about coming behind. It doesn't do a great job of coming behind our, the roll there. But uh, you can see as soon as they tag the roll, especially if they're not willing to help off the corners, um, great way to get yourself an open three. So again, we roll. This time they're going to tag the roll with the far corner. All right. And this is where, you know, you got to drill this all the time, but we do this in practice in live situations and we kind of set up the progression of how the team's going to guard us. It's one of the things we look for in scouting reports. How are they going to help the helper? So, and this, you know, going into this game, we probably knew, I hope we knew, that that guy was going to help or was going to tag off the far corner. So we, you know, everything we drilled in practice that week, we, uh, you know, we drill everything live and we would tell the help that that's where they're going to tag from. So that far corner then comes open. And then again, it's another way to get yourself an open three. And that one probably happens more than any of them. Um, this is against the zone here. So this would be a middle four for us. Our spacing's not great. Our um, guy down in the uh, number 33, you can't really see his number there. Um, should be more in the dunker spot. He's kind of in that mid post area. Um, but you'll see, we'll do this against two, three all the time. We get that line. We don't get zoned very often. Um, so, again, we're against the zone here. This is a different team. Um, they're running, again, they're running a 2-3 zone, a little bit more of a matchup. Um, so if they help off the wing guy who's responsible for the far corner, you're going to have an easy pitch. If they help off the middle guy, they help the ball handler off the middle guy, you're going to have an easy dump off or uh, pitch if they help the helper. Um, and in this case, I think they try to stay with the ball handler, which creates a two-on-one on the top, and we end up getting an open three there. So that's our middle ball screen. Um, our sideline ball screen is, I think a lot of people run this, uh, you know, spread ball screen. I, you see this all over the place. But, um, again, it's another five out spacing here in the top two frames. So this is what we would call a sideline five in the top left frame. Um, if the ball handler uses the big screen, five is a big in this instance. Um, and the big rolls to the rim, two has to fill behind the roll. Um, again, if the screener dives, we always fill behind it. Um, if the screener pops, two would just hold his corner. So that would be an exception to the pop dive rule. Normally we pop the guy away, but or we dive the guy away from the pop, but we want guys to hold the corner because usually there's nobody to rotate over to them. Um, and so both those examples are sideline fives. We, we run those all the time. Um, sideline fours, we don't run a bunch. Uh, if, we, if it does happen, it's usually because somebody cut through and stayed in the dunker spot. It happens once in a while. I think it's good if you have guys who aren't great getting downhill you know if your best player it, you want the ball in their hands and your best ball uh, the best player you have in a ball screen still isn't great getting downhill it's a good way to open up a gap and maybe give them a little bit more space um the situation on the ball side is exactly the same as it is in a five you know you, your situation on the weak side there with four who's in the dunker spot he might duck in or he might try to stay behind it um especially against zones i'd probably try to stay behind it um, but again, that's why it comes back to knowing your game. So let me just show you a few quick examples. I'm not going to spend as much time on this one on video just because I think everybody um, and their brother runs some sort of this that runs ball screens. So 
So again, we got a sideline here. Our guy's going to roll out of it. And in this case, we get downhill. That doesn't happen quite as much on a sideline ball screen unless they're really hugging the corners. Um, there, they help off the corner. It's an easy pitch. And that's why we don't like to move those corners around because if they do help off the corners, it's pretty easy. Um, so again, we roll and we happen to have a guy who's a very good passer um, as one of our bigs. So, you know, if you don't have that, don't worry. That's not something that's necessarily a requirement by any means, but it sure makes you look like a better coach when you do. Um, our, what we call bubble is just an open side ball screen. Um, so we'd have nobody in the corner and then we'd have three on the weak side in some way, shape or form. Um, the top left frame there is the one that probably happens the most where the screen's going towards the middle. Um, and when I say ball screens, I probably should have said this earlier. Ball screen for us can be a ball screen or a dribble handoff. Um, truthfully, I like both dribble handoffs a little bit better because there's a little bit more you can do with them offensively and a little bit less you can do with them defensively. And when I start showing you more of the offense together, you'll kind of see some of that happen. But um, in this case, you know, our big is uh, five. And, um, you know, one comes off of five's uh, ball screen there towards the middle, five rolls. Everybody else just holds their spot. If five sets that ball screen to so the top middle frame here, if five sets that ball screen towards the baseline and he rolls, um, the next man over, four in this case, is going to fill behind. And, again, there's nothing that says that four has to be a big or three, you know, has to be a small or anything like that. Um, so it doesn't really matter how you, who that is in the space over there. Um, again, I think that opens up a lot of opportunities for throws, uh, throwbacks. Um, and then the one that we do a lot because, you know, we're – we're not great rolling to the rim just because we're not, uh, you know, some of our guys just aren't great finishers off of cuts, although we get it more than I care to admit. But um, so we'll pop our guys a lot. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of bigs that can shoot the three well enough to be a threat and they create some bad closeouts. And then we have, a, um, we had two bigs this year that could really put it on the deck. So um, that was a good way for us to get it. If, especially if you had a good matchup to drive to set that up um, on the bottom there, um, bottom left, you know, this is the one we talked about earlier. If the uh, five sets that screen and he pops, this would be a pop dive situation because the next man over isn't in the corner. So again, another good way to create a high low. Um, and that, again, that's another cut that's open a lot. And it also opens up the far corner quite a bit because usually the far corner, his man will help on the, um, his hand man will help on the cut. Bottom middle frame, it would be a four. This is another one we'll run against a zone quite a bit or that'll happen if a guy cuts the rim and doesn't space the floor out to the corner. Um, this is really good against, I think, two, three zones, you know, because usually what will happen is you'll create a three on two or um, a two on one on that weak side there. So um, we'll usually keep that guy in the dunker spot. We'll usually keep him uh, there in the dunker spot. We won't usually dunk, duck him in. But uh, again, five can roll or pop with that spacing. Um, and then in the bottom right corner there, um, same look, only this time the five man uh, decides to. Uh, pop so uh, let me show you these um, again there's a million ways you can run these and I probably didn't do a great job of putting these on the film but um, these I would say outside of our middles this is probably the one that happens the most so here we set one towards the middle our big rules to the rim you can see a cutter thought he had a cut there but um, either way our guy filled behind opened up a three this one we've got our floor space we get a nice little screen and roll since the they don't help the helper um, so here we create a high-low. Again, I don't think we post up a whole lot, but like we said, within our offense, um, every cut is an opportunity to post, whether that's out of a ball screen or out of our, any other action. Um, this guy, this time the, um, our big does a nice job getting positioned down there, creates a high-low, and that's why that guy in the slot has to check before he moves on to the next thing. So here our offense broke down, and I told you we slipped probably more than we set. All right, so this guy, we're in a bubble right here, and um, – our guy, our big set in the screen is a very, very good shooter. So he's going to pop on a lot of things. And you can see here, he doesn't even set the screen. He just slips out of it. So we have all kinds of rules for when to slip. But the last one is if you feel like it. So again, we go dribble handoff here. We go pop flare. And we're going to get another um, slip to the rim. So that's our bubble uh, ball screens. I didn't do a great job of showing those um, against zone. Again, we didn't get zoned a whole lot, so I don't have a bunch of great film from this year on that. Um, our next ball screens are called logos. I think these are probably the hardest to guard, um, but they're also sometimes the hardest to get into without running some sort of action to get to them. I, 
when we run in transition, we don't have a, a set way that we're going to run the floor. We just tell guys to get down the floor as fast as they can, space the floor away from the ball. Um, so if they're on the ball side, they want to space to the corner. Or um, if they're away from the ball side, they, you know, corner, then wing, then slot. Um, but anyway, we tell our ball handler to try to get as close to the hoop as he can um, when he's pushing the ball up the floor and we don't have anything. So when our guy's pushing the ball up the floor and he doesn't have a pitch ahead, we know we're getting into a ball screen from there on out, unless they're just really bad and let us go right to the rim. But that doesn't happen very often. So um, if we can get that ball down to the rim and flip our hips, keep our dribble alive, we're going to tell our nearest big to come down and set a ball screen. Um, when you set them tight to the hoop like that, the tighter you can set it to the hoop, the harder it is to help. So in the first frame there, we call it a logo five. We got five outs facing. In theory, you know, the, we always consider the screener and the ball handler out. Um, but the only thing with a logo is you have to dive. You cannot pop on a logo because it just takes too long to develop and it slows things down. Um, a lot of times the ball handler is just going to get into the paint because nobody's sure on how you practice all kinds of different ball screen situations. Very few teams, and this is why I think this is effective, um, practice how to defend that close to the hoop, how to defend a ball screen. Um, the Houston Rockets, not as much anymore, used to run this all the time. They, they would bring uh, James Harden off some sort of flex screen, throw it to him in the post and then bring a screener down for him and set this next to the rim. Um, they do it out of pistol action. They do it all kinds of different ways. Um, the Cavs, when um, they had LeBron and Kyrie, they would do this. They would try to get uh, the Golden State Warriors to switch Curry onto one of these guys. If they, you know, if Curry, if they couldn't quite get the post up, then they would bring a screener down. Um, so things that happen quite a bit. Um, and the dive guy is almost always open. If you switch, he's got a small, you know, he's got a smaller guy on him usually. If you hedge, he's going to be wide open. Um, if you trap, again, he's going to be wide open. And usually because the help is already in the paint, those three guys on the weak side are almost always open. Um, the second one there is a logo four. Again, same thing, just a little different spacing. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I don't have great film of us. Like I said, we don't do a great job of getting into this. I think this is something we need to get better at. Um, but this has been really effective for us. So this is um, just a couple examples here. We kind of screw up our offense. And so our, our um, ball handler there knows that he's got to space the floor and get us back into a ball screen. So he spaces the floor trying to take that ball as deep as he can. We come down and set the floor. And you can see the defense is really loaded to the ball when you're that close to the hoop. And really, he's going to have a lot of good options coming off of this. And I think he finds our guy up there in a the corner. So this next one is in transition. Again, our, our small does a nice job of getting close to the hoop. We got the floor. We should be spacing the floor a little bit better than we do here. This time, they're going to hedge a little bit. And if you hedge that close to the hoop, there's no way you can help on it. It's, it's almost a guarantee, too, if you can make that pass. Um, so ball screen continuity, I know everybody and their brother wants it. Well, this is where we'll start teaching um, our offense, our X's and O's. Um, and so in the example I'm showing you here, this, I think, is the ball screen continuity that everybody and their brother runs right now. Um, both five and four are bigs in the examples I'm showing you here. Um, and that's usually how we'll start it out, um, just because I think a lot of guys have familiar, familiarity with this you know, kind of action already. So we'll start with the ball screen. And what we'll do is we'll put rules on the guys. So um, anytime we have three guys on a side and a big with the ball, um, we get into what we call the jungle action. I'll talk about that here pretty soon. But um, – the way we'll start it is we'll tell any time the ball goes – or we'll start everything. We'll tell our bigs they have to roll or dive on every single uh, ball screen. And our, our uh, smalls, whenever we get to the next action, have to back up. So um, the reason being is it's just something they're familiar with. So what we'll do is we'll start with the ball screen. And maybe, you know, I'm going to explain this in case people aren't familiar with this. But um, we'll start with the ball screen. If they can't make an action out of it, they're diving. Um, they'll pitch it over to the slot there. Four, again, four is a big. He's going to look high-low. If we don't have that, then as soon as he looks away from five, five has to space the floor. And in this case, um, we'll space our guys to the slot a little bit. If he's a very good shooter, we might space him to the corner. But uh, for the sake of what we're teaching here, we'll start him off by spacing him up to the slot. Um, as soon as four looks away and looks at three, three is then getting into our jungle action. And in this case, we just tell three he's got a back cut every time. So three back cuts, if that's not there, he spaces the floor. And again, he doesn't have to space the floor to the corner necessarily, but for the sake of this, um, that's what we're doing. So I'm on the middle frame here. Four pitches over to the two who's risen out of the corner. 
behind uh, three's back cut and then sticking with our rules because four's a big he follows his ball or he follows his pass with the ball screen and that continuity carries on um, again I think everybody and their brother runs this in some way shape or form even if it's just to learn how to defend it um, the next progression we'll teach then is we'll tell our bigs they have to dribble handoff every time and so when we're, te we're teaching this five on oh early in the year we'll go all right bigs you have to dribble handoff every time and smalls when you get to a jungle, you have to split every time. And this is something that people might not do. So um, when, we, when we tell our guys that they have to dribble handoff, we'll tell them, all right, now you have to pop every time. All right, so we'll mix up what kind of cut they have to run after their dribble handoff or their ball screen. But uh, we'll tell them, all right, we want you to pop every time in the example I'm showing you here. So we'll go five dribble hands off with one. One tries to get downhill, five pops. All right, one doesn't have anything, so it pitches over to four. This is the first frame. I'm moving on to the second frame here. Four's got the ball. He's got to check the action before he moves on to the next one. And because five popped and didn't get the ball, he sets a flare screen for one. All right. Five slips if he wants to, or he can just space up to the slot. Uh, we like to slip a lot. I think we get that a ton, like I said earlier, when we're going over that concept. Um, when four looks away from five, though, he's got to space the floor. And, again, for the sake of what we're doing right now, we'll just have him space to the slot. Um, when four looks at three, then, his next option is, you know, first option we taught him was back cut. The next option we'll teach him is split. What split is, he's going to set a pin down for two, and two has to back cut or curl to the rim. And basically all he's doing is reading his defender to do one or the other. Um, three then, after two clears the screen, is coming back to the ball, and we'll get into another dribble handoff from there. Two is spacing the floor. Um, so we'll run that as a continuity. And then we'll mix up those things. We'll say, all right, our bigs, you guys have to uh, pass and follow, pick and pop this time, and our perimeters, you guys have to split. Or, you know, we'll put them in. And then we'll, um, then we'll add it all. We'll put it all together and we'll say, all right, Biggs, you guys can pass and follow or dribble handoff. And you can dive or pop. I don't care what you do. And perimeters, or I'm sorry, smalls, you guys, can, you guys can back cut or split. So we have two options out of our jungle that I'm going to show you here in a little bit. But this is how we teach it with two bigs. Um, I think that, again, everybody runs this. So I'm not, going to spend, I'm not going to spend any time with video on this. But if you need it, I'll be happy to send it. Um, when we get to a side that's got two players, this will happen a lot of times, maybe out of a, um, out of a pop dive situation or out of a, um, you know, if we set a sideline ball screen and we pitch ahead. So if we've got two si guys on a side and, um, four is a big in the first example there, um, four will, as soon as he looks at three, there's three's cue to come out of that corner. He passes the three and then he follows, sticking with the rules. He follows that with a ball screen. Um, and the example on the right there, four and three are both smalls. All right, so again, sticking with our rules, four passes to three, and he's going to cut hard to the rim, and he's going to space away. Um, as soon, our nearest big, so if you've got two bigs on the floor, whoever's closer to that action, all right, if we've got one big on the floor, it'll just be that guy. But he then follows, he follows to the ball, and if he can receive a pass, he receives a pass, and we run a little handoff without a dribble. Um, that's another thing that's really hard to guard because it's really easy to fake and go the other way if the defense leans. Um, if he can't receive a pass, he just goes into a ball screen. So usually anytime a pass is denied from a small to a big, we just set a ball screen. We don't want to get fancy with it. We don't want to give our guys too many things to think about. Um, slice action. So this is when we have um, a three side. Um, and the guy in the slot or at the top is a small. So in the example here, I'm, we're going to kind of stick back with a bubble here, similar to our ball screen continuity with two bigs. Um, five is set in the ball screen. Five is a big, four is a small. So five sets a ball screen for one. One comes off of it. Five's diving in this case. Doesn't have anything. He pitches over to four. Four looks for that high-low because, again, that's his rule. He's got to check. All right, as soon as he looks away from five, five spaces the floor. All right, and because we know that a small has it, we're going to tell five just to space to the elbow to cut down on his running. One is, is he, as soon as he sees that four has it and four is a small, he's going to space as far away from the ball as he can get. When four looks at three, okay, three's cue is either to split or back cut. Uh, so in the example on the top, I've moved on to the next frame here. I'm in the middle frame. Uh, three has back cut to the rim. And he, again, every cut is an opportunity to post up. Two is risen up behind the cut. Okay, and four passes to two. Again, four is a small. All right, and then the progression from there, all right, five is going to come across as soon as four passes to two. 
and he's going to kind of just come to the elbow. If Four's man is in the way, they'll set a flare screen. Um, a lot of times Four's man is jumped to the ball, so that might be an option. Um, but what we're looking at, too, is going to look real hard at the post real quick just to see if he's got position. And then he's looking to pitch back to Four. Four, then, if he receives that pass, he might take a couple of steps off the screen if it's there. But he can just hold a spot there. Um, Fords then is just looking to see if he can get downhill because we've created all kinds of space for him and three space in the floor. All right. Um, the next example on the bottom, all right, we run the same thing. Okay. We run a ball screener. However, we ended up with uh, small in the slot there on a three side. Okay. So again, the next option he can have is to split. So three runs of split this time. And again, he can split or back cut in that situation. Doesn't really matter. Five space up to the elbow. We're over to the next frame then. Same thing like we did before, all right, like we did on the top right frame there. All right, fours made that pass over to three. Whoops. Sorry. Let me get back to that. All right, fours made that pass to three, but this time four can't receive the ball, so he's just going to make a hard curl to the rim. As soon as he gets over to the opposite slot, lane line extended, he is diving hard to the rim. One is going to fill up behind as soon as he sees four cutting. let we'll see if we can get that cut, and that cut will be open once in a while. Um, and again, two space in the floor. All right, as soon as four clears out of the way, he starts making his cut. Five is going to pop up, okay? And he's got to be good at getting open there. But if he can't get open, he'll just set a ball screen. Um, but he, he'll be open most of the time because usually that guy will help out on the cut a little bit. All right, and once five gets the ball, then we're into a jungle action. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of things. We actually did something a little bit different this past year. Um, I didn't like it as much, so we're going to get back to this action. But I'm going to show you an example of a different team running the slice action. And then I'll show you a little bit of what we did this year, because maybe it'll be good for your team. Um, all right, so slice action. This first frame is not great. I, I'm using a different team here for this. So, all right, we got three on a side. You got to picture, use your imagination on this one a little bit. But um, in this one, Use your imagination and say that that guy cut into the rim is already posted up and we, they ran it off the three side. I'll have a better example in the next frame, I promise. They're, we're just going to throw right back because that post up's not there. And you can see their big is coming over to the elbow. And again, that creates a lot of space to drive that gap now. And in this case, open it up for a three. This is a little bit better. This next frame is a little bit better example of what I'm talking about. So, so right here, ball handler. Guy at the wing, number 24, and guy in the corner, number 13 there, they form a three side, and the guy with the balls is small. All right, so in our case, what we would do here, if we weren't running something else, then I'll talk about the other situation that this spacing comes to, but um, is 24 would either cut or split to the rim, or run a cut to the rim or split with 13. In this case, he runs a cut, 13 fills behind, and again, you can see the bigs coming over as soon as that happens to set a flare screen. It's not open, so that guy curls to the rim. And from here, we're in jungle. And that's what I'll demonstrate next. Um, this next frame here, this is what we did with this this year when we got three perimeters or three smalls on a side. Still, we run kind of the same cut split action, but we set a back screen to set up the jungle. Um, the only thing I didn't like about this, and actually, we were pretty good at this. This next frame's kind of in garbage time, so it's going to look a little easier than it is. But um, the thing I didn't like about this is, it was harder to manipulate who had the ball. And we want the ball in our best player's hands as often as we can. So, all right, jungle action. Um, the term jungle, I think, comes from John Beeline. He has you got real specific language for a lot of things, and he would name every action after an animal. Um, and that's why I think it got called jungle action. I just stuck with it. Um, so there's a lot of things that can happen. So when you get a big on a three side, in the slaughter at the top, like we did at the end of that slice action, or like we do within ball screen continuity, whatever it is, um, we have a lot of options. And what we'll tell the big to do is we'll tell him to call out the action. We have very specific terminology that we'll use for each thing. But you'll hear our guys talking all the time on offense. And a lot of times it's our big making the decision on what we're going to do. So you'll see when we start running offense, our bigs will just wave our guy through sometimes if they want him to run a back cut. Um, or they'll – I don't have sound on it, so you won't be able to hear it. But Or they'll use a term to tell them to do that. So the very first thing that they can do is they can just tell the guy to come for a handoff. Um, and I'll show some video of that. That's something I think is really hard to guard, especially if your guy can get downhill off of that or we can flip the screen and come back the other way. Um, the next thing that they can do, and we kind of demonstrated that earlier when we were talking about ball screen continuity, is they can, um, get that, they can tell the guy to run a ball cut. 
have the next guy fill behind. You can go dribble handoff or ball screen from there, whatever you want. Um, the third thing there, you can run a corner split. Again, that's the one we've demonstrated already. Uh, Met cutter is open a lot on a corner split. I, I would make sure you teach your guys to look for that, um, especially if you can post up on that cut. Um, the next one we can do, we'll set a pin down, and instead of running a split, that guy will come into a handoff. And again, our, our five man in these um, frames here is the one who's making the decision all that. And the way he's making that decision, what we're telling him is, all right, we want the guy in certain – we want the ball in certain guy's hands. So we want to have, run this so that, you know, our best, uh, our best player in a ball screen is the one that's getting the ball. Um, if you've got two or three guys that are pretty good in a ball screen, then they're all pretty good options. If he doesn't like what he has to his right, he can go to his left with it and do that. It doesn't matter if the guy at the wing is a big or a small. Um, all these things are options. And the last thing here um, – we do this a little bit against teams that switch screens um, is we'll set a flare. Um, we'll do this against zones quite a bit too, but um, I don't really have a whole lot of good film of us doing that this year. But um, in the past, this has been really good for us. So if you have teams that are going to switch cutters or switch screens, this is a great alternative to that. And it's something we would probably get ready for in scout. Um, so I'll just show you a few different options out of jungle here, show you some film. So the first one will be a handoff here. We're going to follow our pass with a handoff. In our case, we like to turn and rescreen that. Um, creates a lot of space to get downhill in that situation. Um, this next one, all right, you can see our guy wave him through there. And this is kind of the same stuff we've been doing there. So again, he popped, we flared. I think this next one here is a, yeah, this is a pin down into a hand. It's supposed to be into a handoff. Our guy actually runs a ball screen with it, but it works nonetheless. And you can see they help off the nail so that weak side's wide open. Same thing. I think this one is another pin, uh, pin down into a handoff. This is a little better executed. And if you got guys you can make shots like that, please send them my way. Um, so those are all the things that can happen at a jungle series other than the flare. Like I said, the flare is more for switching defenses and zones. Um, whoops. Didn't mean to do that. I apologize. Yeah, I screwed that up. I'll come back to that. I'm sorry. I got to fix the video here because I want to make sure I'm on cue for the next thing here. So again, see a demonstration of this again, but. All right, so the next piece of our offense is our elbow series. Um, for those guys that are Princeton guys, this is, uh, you know, I think the wave series or the point series or high post series. I, I, different people use different terminology, but it's pretty common action in Princeton. Um, so typically what you've got is you've got a three side. You've got a big at the elbow and, um, you know, on, the, on one side, you've got a one side on the other side or a two side, depending on how you use your terminology. But um, what we're going to do is what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to throw the ball to the elbow and we're going to go run a split one way or another when we get into this spacing. Um, we typically like to start our offense out for this. And this year we started our offense out almost every single game. Um, we would, after any made shot, we would get into this and I'll show you how we get into this later, but um, we would try to get into this as much as possible. So when you get that three side spacing, like we just showed you with the slice action, the other option other than running a slice would be to run an elbow series and we've got our big coming up to that elbow. Um, so you got three, three on a side, you've got a prim or you've got a small with the ball at the top or in the slot there. Um, elbow series is an option there as well. Um, so when the guy throws to the high post, he's got three options. He can run a corner split and then we'll get into a ball screen after that. He can run a wing split and get into a ball screen and the second frame on the top there. Um, or he can run a flex action. Um, different people do different things. You know, I think if you watch NBA, this is a pretty common thing. Um, they'll have some different act. They'll have four or five actions that they'll run with us. For us, we just have the three. But all these things we're trying to get in ball screens. When we run these splits or these flex actions, we are trying to see if we can get a cutter to the rim hard. We're trying to see if we can create a post up before we get into that ball screen. And these are all quick decisions. Um, if that pass is denied, we just step out and set a middle ball screen. If that pass from our um, – Small to our big is denied. So in that last frame, the pass from one to five would be denied. Again, we don't want to get complicated with it. We just set out 
We just uh, step up and set a ball screen. Our guys know what to do. Um, the way we get into this, if we want to start our offense in this, and we love to start our offense in this. When we started our offense in this after made shots, we averaged 1.2 points per possession this year. We shot um, just over 56% from the field, and we turned it over less than one out of seven times. So this was really, really good for us. Um, I think there are some teams in college and the NBA that are really good in this stuff. So what we do is we, we, call, we started in what we call 21. Um, I don't know why I call it 21 other than when I draw it up, there's a two and a one on the top. But um, anyway, what we'll do is the very first option is the one man in the top left frame we call wave. He can just wave the two man through and two will just, uh, he just kind of cuts through the foul line area and five is cutting up behind that uh, two's cut uh, two and three space the floor on that side. And then we're trying to hit that guy at the elbow as he cuts. Um, truthfully, our guys get a little lazy with it. We're trying to hit that guy in the move if we can uh, come into the elbow. Our guys get a little lazy with it and they'll throw them into the slot. It works either way. Um, I would prefer it's at the elbow just because it's a little bit harder to help. Um, if that five, uh, has a matchup and he wants to drive from that elbow. Um, the next one we call swing, and all that means is we're running the same thing, but we're going to start with a swing and pass from one to two. So that the top right frame there, one passes to two. Now he's going to cut through. Four and one will space on that weak side. Two, five just comes up behind the cut to the nearest elbow, and uh, two's hitting five. And then again, we're into our elbow action from there. And then the last one, maybe we've got a five we can post up. Um, we didn't have anybody that could really post up well this year, so we didn't run this option very often. But um, one looks at three or brings it, waves him up, and you'll see our guys just blatantly wave him up a lot of times. He's going to pass to three, and five is supposed to uh, – the guy who's in the dunker spot there is supposed to post up a little bit. Um, our guys a lot of times would just come up to the elbow. Three then – all right, after one makes his pass, it's a small, small pass, so he's cutting through, sticking with his rules. Two, two will fill him behind a little bit to get this floor spacing right. Same thing with four. And three will then pass to two. And when three passes to two, he's going to space back down to the corner. And then two tries to hit five. We're into our elbow stuff. <clears throat> um, I'm going to show a lot of examples for this because this, I think, in the examples here, you're going to see our offense kind of come together here. Um, and I, rather than just show you one frame, you know, one part of the action like I did with the ball screens, I'm going to try to show you everything together. So this is our 21 entry into our elbow series. Um, this is from our conference championship game. It's one of the better teams in our league. They really had trouble guarding this. And again, we created a sideline ball screen with a pop there. Kind of got us wide open. Um, so again, a swing. Guy's cutting through. We had the guy. I'd prefer he catch that at the elbow, but it's not a huge deal. Get a hard cut, and because they both kind of go with the cutter, opens up a shot for one of your better players. The thing I tell you is make sure your best two guys in ball screens are the two guys at the top of this. Our spacing's not great here, but we run a nice hard cut. We get over to it, follows our pass, and again, we're into a sideline ball screen. He dives, creates an opportunity to post up. Um, here we run a little flex action, I believe. This is our very first possession of the season, I think. And our screener slips in and posts. Again, every cut's an opportunity to post, and we get a nice kick out three. So a lot of different things that can happen off of that. Um, here we wave the guy through. Cutter gets in, cut a little bit harder than that, but we get that cut quite a bit because for exactly that reason, guys get confused a little bit as we're spacing or they fall asleep. Um, you'd be surprised how much off, how often it's open and we don't hit that guy, but we work on that quite a bit. So again, we're waving the guy through. This time we run a, a wing split. We're trying to run a dribble handoff, they deny. We get a nice little back cut. That's just guys playing back, you know, that's just guys playing basketball. So we're not calling anything here. All this is our guys making reads. So, again, two guys go with the cutter this time. Opens up a three again. So I had two guards, well, three guards that were, uh, you know, smalls that were really good in a ball screen. Those guys were almost always the guys. That way the ball always ended up in their hands. And you see we get a little bubble uh, screen and dive there. So this is a through action here, a really weak attempt to post it up there. But, you know, we run a corner split, don't have anything, get into our ball screen. They go underneath and give us an open three. And that guy was allowed to shoot threes off the dribble. Some guys aren't. We have a read for that then, too, if they go under. 
So again, this time we run a flex action out of the through action after the through action to get into elbow. Dribble handoff. They go with the dive and it opens up three on the weak side there. So that's one of the ways we can start our offense with our 21 series that gets us to our elbow action. Again, elbow action is an option anytime you've got a small at the top, a three side to one side and a one side to the other. Um, next thing is our 50 series. This is kind of an alternative to jungle. Um, you know, if you end up in a jungle situation and you don't trust your guys enough to make decisions on that, this kind of takes some of the decision making out of their hands. We would run this as a way to start as an entry into our offense quite a bit. We didn't really run it after that. We'd do jungle after that. But um, if we got into a five out situation again with a uh, big and a slaughter at the top. Um, so in this, um, whoops, next one, I'm sorry. Um, in this one, what we're just trying to do, and if you watch the Milwaukee Bucks, they do this a ton. Um, they're going to swing the basketball um, through the big. And instead of following his pass with a ball screen to a small um, or getting to the next action as it would be if that was a big, we're going to set a screen away. Um, and the big, again, is going to make a decision. Are we setting a single screen or are we setting a double screen? The reads are all the same from there. But if they use the screen and come to the top, um, then we'd have, again, we'd have a small at the top probably, um, a three side to one side, a one side to the other. That would get us into elbow action or middle ball screen. Um, that would be the same. So that's kind of the top frame there on the left, the middle frame on the top there. Um, he, the guy receiving the screen, one in here in the example, he decides he's going to curl. So we're still running a single screen away. Um, we swung it. We, he, our five decided to run a single. So our one is getting trailed. So he tries to curl it to the rim. When that happens, five steps back, we hit him, and then we get into a two-side action with two in most cases. Um, and then we can do the same thing with a double screen. So a double screen, all right, five swings the ball. He decides to run a double screen. He tells one that we're going to double. Instead of double screen, that guy uses the screen. If he receives the pass, all right, then we're into an elbow action or a middle ball screen. Uh, bottom left-hand frame there, if he curls it, just like if um, we curled a single screen, we get into a two-side, and we'll talk uh, – again, I'll show you some examples of that. And the last one we can run, we can run a double action. Again, this is just a read by the guys receiving the screens. but if uh, two is receiving the screens here, he decides that he is going to um, – this guy's playing real tight and he can curl that thing to the rim. Um, one reads that after the guy clears the screen and he comes back to the top. Then usually we're just into a ball screen there because we're spaced kind of funny and our guys know how to handle a ball screen better than how to handle a pinch post, which we don't really run. So um, let me show you some film on this because I think this is really good stuff too. So again, here we use a single screen and our spacing, you can't see the guy in the far corner there, but, um, and the guy should be a little bit more, the guy in the top of the screen, this should be a little further deeper in the corner there, but he uses the single screen and we get into elbow action. All the same stuff we've been running. We stick with our pop dive rules, we get a bad closeout, we drive it to the rim. Again, here we single away, another elbow action. This time we run a wing split. That should have been a pop dive. Now we're in our jungle action because we got five out. He didn't like what he sees, so he goes back to the guy who wants it in. And if you see, I'm going to stop this here, the guy who made the cut in the jungle action, he's not much of a shooter. So this is a guy that didn't shoot many threes. You can see that's he's maybe six feet tall. It's that. Um, he spaced himself to the dunker spot, and this is a great example of why he did that. Now his man helps, and that doesn't have to be a big. His man's probably a small two. So here we run a double screen. He uses the screen. All right, we can, run a, we can run an elbow action, so we do. Corner split. We get an open three, and we get these a lot. Right? It's not a coincidence. All right, so here, again, we run a double screen. This time the cutter, just, or this time the cutter can't get it to the big. So the big just steps up and sets the ball screen, and now we're in the middle ball screen action. He dove, so the guy behind him lifted. Every cut's an opportunity to post up. He posts up. We get a nice high-low there. All right. If we start our offense this way and we can't make a safe pass to the big, 
we just point the guy, and, uh, we just point, and that means we're gonna run the double screen or single screen to the other side. Um, it's just a way, that way we don't have to worry about what to do when they deny. Again, we use a screen, can't make a great pass to the big, so we set a middle ball screen here. Our big rolls this time, opens up a gap for our smalls, the defense broke down and we made a play. Um, and this one we curl, we set a double screen, our guy decides to curl it. So now, as he decides to curl it, we throw back to the big and the big can go either direction with it, but usually we like him to go away from his pass and just get into a ball screen or handoff. This is actually a great possession here. We're into all our ball screen rolls. We get a nice top dive. He opens up the gap. We get a nice drive and dunk there. All right, same thing. We're going to curl the screen this time. We'll throw back. We'll go the opposite direction, get the ball. And now we're into a bubble ball screen. Don't have anything. We're on to our next action. We'll jungle there. We get a nice pick and pop. We get an open three. All right, same thing. We're going to double away. A little bit slow curling it, but we do it anyway. He didn't like what he sees, so he just goes that way. We're into motion. All right, we're, we're into our next action. So now we're in a jungle action. You can see our guys waving him through. Come up, pass denied, and that's an automatic for us is a uh, back door. Same thing, double away. He curls. We're back into it. Go away from your pass. Creates a nice little slip there. And like I said, we slip just as much as we set ball screens. All right, and this one he decides to, I'm not sure why he made this decision, but he decided he's gonna curl the first. Our guys know what to do with that. And anytime that's, that's what we call a Celtic action. We didn't execute it very well there, but um, anytime we run a Celtic action, the guy at the top, we always go into the ball screen. We could run an elbow action out of that spacing, but sometimes our guy spaces away. All right, so done with that there. So again, that's all that stuff kind of fits together. And the way we make those decisions is we make those decisions based on how do we get the ball to our best guys or how do we get the ball to the guys that are going to make the best decisions. Um, the spacing dictates what we're running. So however, where we see the ball, where's the big and where's the ball and how are we spaced tells us what we run. And so, you know, if we've got a three side and a big high with the ball, we're in jungle. If we've got a three side and a small high with the ball, we're in slice. Um, and all those things lead to a ball screen and that ball screen then usually leads to another action. And those things just kind of flow together. And what we'll do in practice a lot of times is we will just tell these guys, all right, you've got to run offense for a minute. You can't score until a minute's up. And so they have to just keep that thing moving and moving until they, you know, and they just run our options and all our stuff until that ball thing. So they get the, they understand the concept that, you know, the offense always has an option. Um, scouting report is the next really big thing on this. I'd say there's two other big things. The one I'm not going to have time to cover, but um, you got to be able to answer these questions in your scouting report. All right. How does the opponent defend ball screens with the man defending the ball? Do they go over or do they go under? Do they force a certain direction? Are they, do they do it differently based on personnel? Um, you know, sometimes like with some of our smalls can't shoot behind a ball screen. So teams will go under those guys. Some of the guys that they can't shoot, they'll go over. Um, that takes a lot of practice. It's hard to do if you're going to do different things. But, um, you know, everybody's different, I guess, with that. How does the opponent defend the ball with the man defending the screener? All right. Um, what kind of coverage are they running? Are they flattening it? Are they running a switch? Are they downing it? Are they hard show? Are they blitz? Are they trap? Again, are they doing it differently based on personnel? You know, maybe one guy can switch um, who's guarding a screener because he's good at defending on the perimeter. Maybe another guy's got to, you know, run a flat. Um, that happens a lot. I'd say the flat uh, hedge is usually what we see the most, flat or switch. Um, we've seen a lot of downs this year too. Um, and then this one I think is we kind of talked about a little bit. How does the opponent help the screener's defender? How are they helping the help? Do they tag? The dive off of the ball side or weak side. So if a guy's rolling to the rim, are they? How are they tagging him? How are they giving help? Do they give extra help in the gap, or do they stay home at, off the weak side corner? Um, I think you got to know all three of those. And when we prepare for a game, what we'll typically do is we'll start out practice with some sort of defensive warm up, just uh, you know, kind of defending the other team stuff like everybody does. 
Um, and then we go into an offensive warm-up, too, where we'll take three guys, create a jungle action, and then we'll have a manager play dummy D, how, our def- uh, how the defense is going to play us in the upcoming game. What we'll do from there, then, is the guys have to make their reads, and we'll really spend a lot of time teaching them how to read different things. And that's, that could be a whole clinic by itself. I really wish I had time to go over that, but I don't. But we have a different read for a flat, for a switch, all that stuff. We're, we have different ways that we're going to play that. And then this is, I think, really important, too. Who are the wor- opponent's worst defenders? Who's worst on the ball? Who's worst in coverage and recovery? You know, you want to manipulate that a little bit. So if their worst defender is guarding a guy for you that can only shoot, you know, you need to figure out how to get that guy's shots and get him into action so that they have to help. If he's guarding one of your ball handlers or a lot of times the worst defender is guarding one of your bigs, you know, how are we going to attack him? You know, we got to be able to answer that question. And if you can do all four of those things, you're probably going to score a lot of points, I think. Um, teams to study, I think if you want to run stuff like this in the NBA, the Denver Nuggets, the Milwaukee Bucks, and the Boston Celtics all run a lot of this. Um, I spent a lot of time last summer uh, studying the Nuggets and the Bucks. Um, Division One, Richmond, uh, Campbell University, and Lipscomb. Right now, uh, Lenny Acuff is the coach at Lipscomb. He runs up a lot of that. We stole a lot of this from him. Um, NCAA Division Two, Alabama, Huntsville, where Lenny Acuff was before this, um, from 2012 to 2019. They ran some similar stuff. I think it's good. NCAA Division Three, um, Nebraska Wesleyan runs a lot of 21 series, elbow series stuff. That's really good. Johns Hopkins runs a lot of jungle. Um, Rochester, New York runs a lot of stuff where they'll flow from a ball screen to a Princeton action to a ball screen to a Princeton action. Um, all that's really good. Um, I, I would highly encourage you to study those teams too. I, I think they're all really fun to watch. I think they're really good at what they do. Um, if you have questions and you're watching this now, questions and are, you're watching this in the tape delay and we'll have questions, feel free to email me anytime. I'm a little slow getting back to emails, but I promise I will get back to everyone that writes me. Um, so that's all I got. Um, I'm not sure. I, hopefully, I ran that in the amount of time we needed to. <laughs> yeah, there was no real time limit, Coach. If you, I mean, if you want to keep going, we can let you keep going. Or if we want to, if you want to come uh, back, I mean, we can do that as well, or talk about that later. Um, well, we'll be here all night if you let me keep going. So that's, uh, <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, we'll turn it over to some questions. Back. I'm sure people yeah. have families and stuff they got to get back to. Yeah, um, I just had a few comments. I think Jeff might have had a question for you, but. Early on, you mentioned how, you know, you can run this junior high through pro. I mean, I saw a lot of pro concepts and actions that you talked about. And somehow it seems that, like, the higher, the higher levels you get, it's, it's simpler and simpler, you know, concepts and actions. It's more of how to play and not what to do. So, so I really appreciate that. Um, Jeff? Yeah. So I know you talked about all your offense and your defense. And – what I wanted to ask you is when you're recruiting, what, are, what is um, something you look for in your players to go along uh, with in? We look for two, two things. One, are, are they self-aware? You know, are they guys who are trying to do too much or, you know, are they guys who know who they are? Um, it makes my job a lot easier when they get here if they know who they are. Um, so we really look for that. And then we look for versatility. You know, the more versatile. We don't. We have kind of limited scholarship money here, so for us to go out and get that six foot eight guy who can just slog it out in the post isn't realistic. Now we've had a couple of guys who are really good like that, but um, it, it's hard for us to get those guys. So, but it, we can find those guys who instead of maybe a six foot eight guy, we can find a six foot six guy that's uh, you know two hundred pounds, but he can put it on the deck or he can shoot it a little bit. Um, so we just try to find guys who can do more than one thing. Um, I really like guys who can pass. I, I think the more guys you have that can pass, the better. Uh, this past year. We played about nine guys in our rotation, and seven of them could really pass. Um, needless to say, our offense looked a lot better when those guys were on the floor. But um, really like that. And, and, again, it doesn't have to be, you know, the fancy passes and all that stuff. I think a lot of it's just, you know, the guys who understand you can make the quick decisions. I, I really think quick decision-making is a really underrated thing. You, you can make fast players into slow players and, and so on and so forth. And the faster a guy can make decisions and make good decisions, um, the harder I think you are to guard. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Awesome, Coach. Well, I I just asked if there are any audience questions, but I don't see any at the moment. Um, Shoot. Hold on. There we go. I'd be definitely interested to have you back talk about more, maybe do one in the fall or something like that. But uh, I really – I mean, all those actions are great. I especially like the – the Celtic action and then the pin down to the DHL, that's some stuff I'm going to for sure use. Um, but, yeah, um, I, again, thanks again for coming on.
I look forward to staying connected. Jeff, do you have anything else for Coach? I think Vontae needs or has a question. Okay, I'm gonna I'll take him off here. Hey, so uh, I'm a, I'm a really big fan of um, motionless and kind of well playerless and kind of positionless offenses. Um, mm-hmm. I don't, having one person do one role kind of stagnates everything, right? And it uh, and it puts people in holes. Curious, uh, you 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 just mentioned uh, making players uh, quicker decision makers. Now, coming from systems, I know a lot of guys don't play in open systems, kind of like yours. Um, what's mm-hmm. one of the first things that you kind of teach or instill in your guys to kind of make them better decision makers? Um, and I um, guess- no, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I think for us, what we do is we actually try to limit what they're allowed to do early on. So when we have guys who are coming from – especially guys coming from situations like you're talking about, what we'll do is we'll tell them, okay, you know, this is – when you get into – you know, let's say we get into a jungle situation. The only thing you can do here is back cut. Or the only thing you can do here is uh, do this. You know, we, so we might give them like two things so that they can mix up their game a little bit. And then we'll add to it as they get better. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with how we practice. You know, like I said, we'll drill those things out with a dummy defense and practice. We'll then move on to some small sided games to create the situation that we think we're going to go against. I think that really helps them learn their decision making. And then, honestly, we do a lot of five-on-five. Five. You know, we end every practice playing five-on-five, five, whether it's half-court, full-court, mm. you know, situational type of stuff. But um, we'll try to set up a situation so that we'll say, all right, we're going to start, um, you know, let's say we got a guy who needs to learn how to run jungle series, for example. All right, we're going to start our offense out in jungle series. Um, I mentioned we don't call play, so what I do is I tell, all right, after every single make, we're starting in our, our 21 to elbow, or we're starting on our 50, or we're starting on the jungle, or we're starting on the middle ball screen. And, I, you know, some of that's based on scouting report, but a lot of that, um, we'll just do that in practice then. You know, all right, we're going to start out practicing um, jungle series today. Or we're going to start out 21. Um, and that way those guys get live reps. You know, I, I think the more you can do live reps, the easier it gets for them. And, and truthfully, one of the things that I like about this, it looks like a lot as I'm presenting it. It took me an hour and 15 to present it. But it's really actually really, really simple stuff. And, and I think that's one of the things I like about it is they can learn those decisions a lot more quickly rather than, you know, you know, like a Bobby Knight motion, which is great stuff and all that stuff, but it takes forever to learn how to, you know, react to a guy coming off the screen and everything else and you read that guy and make those decisions. I think that just takes forever and it's hard to teach. Um, this is a little bit easier to teach. So you put it in early, um, you give them limited decisions. Like uh, we had a post guy who was really good for us. Uh, he's like a traditional post up guy. Um, he's one of our bigs. He graduated a couple of years ago who, when he came in, he played in a really rigid system where he was only allowed to do a couple of things. So when he got here, we tell them when you when you set a ball screen, the only thing you're allowed to do is dive to the rim. You know, we start right there with him. So that was his decision every time. We kind of took that out of him. Or we tell him, you know, because he was he wasn't very good in dribble handoff situations. So we tell him when you're in jungle, you have to call something that's gonna end. You can't call a handoff. You've got to call something that's gonna end up in a um, end up in a ball mm-hmm. screen. And we tell him what those things are. So uh, and as they get as he got better, he ended up playing professionally overseas uh, in Australia for a very short time, but. Um, as he got better and better at understanding those things, um, truthfully, he started telling me stuff. Those guys kind of read things as they go on. But, um, you know, we, we give them more and more than they were allowed to do. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I don't have anything else for you, Coach. I uh, like I said I appreciate you coming on, and I hope we can reconnect and, you know, maybe get you back on. we got some times next week. Oh, thanks for having me. This was fun.